Hi, this is Christina Woodkey, and I'm talking with Dave Gray. This is my first public hangout. Um, I've been trying to figure out how do you make conceptual models um, of ideas either for um, explaining how something's going to work for your team, like a new app or a website, or explaining how a service will work for your customer. Often a conceptual model is a great way to see how um, a lot of complexity is reduced into a simple offering. And Dave Gray just agreed to hop online with me for a second and explain how he thinks about it. So Dave, um, I was hoping you would uh, help talk me through how I can make conceptual models as well for these kinds of situations. Yeah, so explaining things, basically? Um, yeah, explaining things. Like, let's say I went out and I figured out this complicated idea about how um, we make digital products, or uh, I have this cool new Facebook killer, and I want to explain it to people. Yeah, well, I would start by just uh, asking you to explain it to me, and usually I like to take notes on uh, cards or sticky notes, so that gives me the option to move them around and arrange them. So, um, do you have something that you want to tell me about? Uh, well, sure. Um, there is one thing I've been working on. I've been trying to build a simple model to talk about the elements of creating a good digital product um, because, you know, I teach uh, UX a lot. And I'm trying to explain to my students with a model that they can hold in their head throughout, say, an eight-week class of all the elements. Um, and I found that Jesse's diagram, while it's awesome, um, tends to lead towards... Uh, that's the one that kind of looks like this? Yeah, that's it. Um, unfortunately, people tend to look at it like a waterfall diagram. Like the elements of user, it's like a lay... Yeah, I, I, I couldn't just give you the pieces of it, but I've, I've seen it. I could give you the pieces of it, but um, I'm not sure if that's helpful. Um, I found that when I give it to students, they have a tendency to sort of think of it as... Um, well, there's a lot of ongoing issues with it, and I want something a little simpler and something that's more iterative. Well, give me the name of it, because this is one thing that I do. When somebody references something, I want to make sure I can find it later. So it's... The yeah. Elements of User Experience. Okay. It's a really important model, and it has shaped our industry tremendously. Okay. It's pure hubris that I want to do something different, but that works Okay. For okay. So... Um, so, the, so it has a lot of the same pieces as Jesse's model. Actually, yes and no. About half as many, maybe, and it is a little bit different. Um, the pieces it has is um, humans and medium and information organization, interaction. I don't want to go too quickly. Yeah, that's a, that's another thing. Is like um, you can you can go as fast as you like, but uh, it's help. It is helpful. I find that you can see what I'm doing. Definitely, it helps a lot. All right. And then, as well as that, it has aesthetics and an organizing framework. Okay. And those are the pieces. Those are the pieces. Those are, in your view, those are the elements. Yes, they are. I would say human and medium are a little bit different um, from the other ones. Four of them are design things, activities that we do, and the other two are considerations. So these are different than the others. Mm-hmm. Or one of them more important than the others, or...? I used to think humans were more important than medium, but then I've realized that you can't disregard re medium. So I would say they're all fairly equally important. I just our relationships are different to them. Okay, so I know what humans are. <laughs> uh, what do you mean by medium? Um, is it going to be a web page? Is it going to be an app? Is it going to be smart furniture? ATM machine. How how will this digital thing manifest itself into the world? Okay. So. Does that make sense? Yep. I love clarity. Um. All right. So that's let's just talk, take humans and medium and separate them out here. I think of what's his name's uh, Bill. Is it Bill Verplank who has this thing like this that he draws? 
I love his little faces, yeah. Something like that. Okay. So uh, can I reflect back to what I'm seeing? It seems like right now you're trying to see how these things are different and how these things are alike. With, is that true? Uh, I'm just trying to understand what you mean by them because words are uh, actually a lot more vague than people usually think they are. Mm, I agree. When somebody says medium, I have an idea of what that means. A human, I, I don't think I need to worry about because we all, I think we, I, we have a shared understanding of what a human is. Um, but uh, yeah, in your context, I want to figure out what what all these things are that you mean. So, um, Great. what do you mean by information organization? Um, I basically mean, are you familiar with Richard Solwerman's latch? Yeah. So every digital object now is filled with information. Maybe it's photos in a photo sharing, maybe it's articles in a writing, but almost every digital object now has tons of information or data in it. And we have to figure out how that's going to be organized. That's a design exercise. So it's going to be alphanumeric, it's going to be organized by location, um, is it going to be organized by time, recently used, et cetera, et cetera. I like, I like Latch, what can I tell you? It's a nice shorthand for thinking that information has to be thought about how it can be organized, and there's a lot of ways to do it. Yeah, I like Latch too, although it's not... Um, um, Complete? No, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's... I like categories that are mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive, and it's not that. That is the most beautiful sentence I've heard today. <laughs> well, for example, uh, alphabet is one of his organizing principles, and organizing things alphabetically, and category is another one, and organizing things alphabetically is also organizing by category. There, yeah. I agree with you. Category. category is sort of a sloppy misc uh, bucket. I, I find it a little Which suspicious. One? Category? Oh, see, I think category is I, category makes. I think alphabet is the doesn't belong. I think you, alphabet is part of category. Well, let's pretend that there's something that's better than latch, and latch is standing there pretending that it's better than it is. How about that? I like latch. I like latch. Yeah, it's it's better than it's, nothing, which is yep, seems like what we have now. <laughs> it's great. Um, so that's the uh, that's the information organization is the choices that you make about how things are organized. Yeah, how are things going to be found? How are you going to display them? The well, I'm, under, I'm going to underline choices because I, I have a, a hypothesis that all the other things that are not humans and medium are going to be choices too. So yes, you are quite right about that. Right. Uh, <laughs> interactions. What do you mean by that? Um, what happens... I mean, I, I, I can be lazy and say interaction design, but I'd rather be precise since that's something that you're emphasizing. So by that, I mean, how does the computer respond when the human being um, acts? Yeah, so uh, what kind of interactions are possible and not possible? Yeah, and then what happens next? And those are all choices as well. I choose that the feedback's going to be fast, I choose that feedback's going to be delayed, I choose that you can use a button, I choose that it's a text box. I make lots of choices about what a human can tell the computer and how the computer responds. Okay. I can see, you can see how that fits into this other one, right? Sort of. Yeah, it, there's a connection there for sure. What about um, organizing framework? So uh, this is the hardest one in some ways, but I believe that when you sit down to do a digital product, there's an underlying logic that holds the other three things together. So for example, if you were creating um, a word processing software, you might decide to do a Canvas tools framework. In other words, we're going to have a place where we write and there's going to be a set of tools that you interact with. Or you might decide that it's a wizard, right? Step by step by step. Or you might decide that you were going to do, not for a word program, but for some other kind of program, maybe I was trolling in the depths of Windows today, maybe you do uh, control panels where you can see all the settings and manage all the settings. And these are all organizing frameworks. 
I think that they're significantly different because they hold all the information, all the interactions, and all the aesthetics sort of together. They're like um, a mega design decision. Uh, almost like a paradigm. Mm, yeah, definitely. I've been struggling for the right word for it, but I don't think it belongs particularly to any one discipline. There's always a something that holds everything together and, dis and guides all your decisions afterwards. It's like an opera, almost like an operating system, too. Uh, yeah. Almost. If you were designing an operating system, you definitely would need a paradigm. I have a fantasy about designing an OS that's based on Canvas tool model. Well, so like a, a lot of apps these days on the phone have a card deck kind of a paradigm, and Google Glass seems to have a sort of a card deck type of, I guess, uh, organizing framework OS. Yeah, okay. I could kind of understand what you mean. Exactly. And I want to call it out because I think it keeps getting ignored, as it was in Elements as well, uh, Jesse's diagram. And I think we have a lot of broken products because there's no organizing framework that makes them coherent. Oh, that's a good word, coherence. It's one of my favorites, up there with clarity. What about the aesthetics? So aesthetics, I think most people will think of it as look and feel. But I like to borrow the term from game design, in which aesthetics describes the sort of pleasures and experiences you'll have. Um, for example, let's take, you're probably like me, you've probably used a lot of drawing programs. Um, there's a big difference between Procreate on the iPad, which is like Photoshop. The aesthetics are all about utility and power mm -hmm. um, versus, say, 53's paper, in which the aesthetics are about uh, being artistic and being in the field, you know, painting in plain air. And so an aesthetic is, is a, a type of pleasure or a type of experience, perhaps, that is then expressed via uh, imagery, color, type, um, font, you know, the big bag of tools that visual designers often have. But also, the, not only that, also um, with our new tools like iPads, it could be, you know, the accelerometer feeling. It could be the Google Glass swipe feeling. There's a lot of tactile experiences. Well, um, aesthetics have, would have a lot to do with the interactions as well and, and also the organizing framework, wouldn't it? Yeah, it does. It does. Um, the choices here is what sort of mood am I going to set? What kind of feeling am I going to create? Why not I just call it feeling instead of aesthetics? It might be actually a better description of what you're talking about. It might well be. And I like unfancy words. Uh, superficial. So aesthetics is, is visual. Feeling is deeper, yeah. Feel. Maybe just feel. Yeah, feel. I like feel. And I think you're right. I, I Anytime I can avoid a fancy word for a simple word, I feel happier. Yeah, feels feels good because that feels right to me. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, um, all right. So I've uh, I'm a little bit spoiled or polluted because I read your blog post that you're writing on this. It's the sort of secret, not public thing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Well, I asked for your feedback before publishing, so. Uh, yeah. So I have some understanding of your what you've learned from your other interviews, and I don't disagree with any of it actually. Um, but I did, uh, I did feel that there was a, something missing, which is the um, most of the. If you remember the thing that I did yesterday, that little nine by nine matrix. Oh yeah, I love that. Almost everything that you know, almost everything that you had in that uh, covered in that thing was in that top row. It seemed to me, it was all you know the the abstract stuff. Yeah. So it was like, you know, diagrammatic kinds of things, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so one of the things that I'm, as I'm listening to you, and I'm actually also making this connection to, uh, I think it's Bill Verplank's model that I'm thinking about, where he talks about buttons and, so you know what I'm talking about? You know the... No, but I'm pretty sure I can look it up. I've read a lot of his stuff, it's not oh. ringing a bell. He has a model. If I if I have the guy's name right, 
he has a model where he's got a user and an interaction and he calls the different two kinds of interactions like handles and buttons mm. and there's a map in the person's head I think uh, and he basically just draws this picture of a cycle, like a feedback cycle or something like this. I, I'm probably screwing it up. But I have a picture in my head, and I think that all, most of the things in your picture here, have, they can map to that. And so what I like about this is you've got a person in the center of it, and you're seeing a, a sort of a um, – this is a, a – maybe a more um, integrated model where you're not actually doing something where it's like um, everything's a circle, <laughs> you know, and it's just like how are we going to put the circles together <laughs> or everything's, uh, a, we got five leaves and some of them overlap or this thing like the, that Jesse made where it's like we have layers, like a layer cake. Um, what I like about the one that Bill Verplank did is it actually integrates everything into one picture. So you can, it's almost like a memory palace. You can have an idea of what, how everything relates to everything else, but it's actually visualized so you can see the, how these things are connected to each other. So my first thought is to try and rip off Pilver Plank somehow and uh, see if these things could all fit because we have already, we have the human, and we can draw a picture of a human. And... Um, you talked about, you know, and then we, we have this interaction. So there's some kind of interface. Maybe just call it this an interface. It could be a lot of different things, right, where this interaction is going to happen. Um, so what kind of actions, interactions are possible? Well, you have the uh, whatever the, and this actually we're getting into head, heart, and hands again because you talked about mood, right? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. So we have the action that the that the person can make into this to the system, whatever that is, and then we have the response that comes back from the system. So there's an action, and there's a response, and in this is all all this is what you were calling interactions. Right? Yes, definitely. So that's one piece, interactions. Then you have, let's see if I got my missing one. Okay. That's why I put these things on cards so I can think about them. And reorganize and them. That's how right. are they organized? Maybe there's a way to put something over here that shows you, you know, organizing principles or something, which is kind of behind there. It's, it's behind, it's sort of, to me, it's underneath. So maybe we actually turn it so this person is working down. So we, if we want to have, you know, there's a meta metaphor of above and below and what's underneath that we could use maybe there. And again, you're doing the same thing. You're drawing the words as you speak out loud that we saw Stephen and Dan. Okay. Nice. Yeah, so this here, uh, this line here might be the medium. I'm realizing this is kind of messy here, but mood. The mood is actually something that lives in the person that you're trying to create with these other things, I think. So by the interactions, by the organizing principles, and maybe by the surface or the, maybe we could put the aesthetics in here. The feel makes the mood? You are trying to create the mood. Mm -hmm. The mood happens in the person, not in the actual software. So there's, or what would you say? Oh, feel, actually, sorry. So feel actually is, how do you feel? So I like, I always like things that, I mean, I do see head, heart, and hands as a very helpful um, kind of triangulation method to sort of make sure you've got everything covered when you're talking to people or dealing with people. Organizing framework. Okay, information organization and organizing framework. There's a lot of overlap. That's what makes it so tricky. They're unique, but they uh, all intertwingle. Hmm. 
Yeah, well, you might actually want to have layer those. So it might, you might actually have organizing framework and info organization or, or vice versa and put them together. And I don't know, I mean, I, I hate to draw that as a filing cabinet, but that's the first thing that comes into my head. You know, how things are organized. So that would be my first stab. I would probably take this and try and redraw it a few times and see if I could make it feel better. But that's a, I'd say that's a kind of a, a, a first stab at an architecture. Got it. So there's a, uh, you spend a lot of time unpacking. Would you um, throw it out and do a complete new one sometimes? Or do you try different kinds of frameworks? Or do you usually just... Um, it probably depend on it, how well that resonated with you. I would probably take this and test it a little bit. Um, yeah, I might pull out another, but I happen to know that you already have some others. So <laughs> yeah, you you've already got three or four to play with. So I would try and pull out some of those and say, you know, let's put those on the table and let's uh, find a way. Um, you know, you know how they say in um, some of the agile uh, software. Uh, concepts they talk about doing a test mm. so I would say well you know what's the test of this and there's something that I use from the game storming uh, manual called hoodoo which is a really pretty good test um, who are you talking to with this you said students right am I right yes definitely that's and my core audience what would they, if they understand this thing right you know what exactly do you think they would do differently Oh, that's, that's great. How do you think they would behave differently than they behave today? Hmm. Would they give you this information? Would they articulate it, be able to articulate it to you? Would they? Um... I'm actually looking for a change in process more than anything else. Okay. So back when I was studying painting, we used to talk about working the canvas. Is that a term you guys used too? You explained it to me. Um, oh, yes. So When I interviewed you. That, I'm, I'm just obsessed with working the canvas right now. And I think um, the big process change I'd like to see the students do is constantly move back and forth between the aesthetics and the information organization and the organizing principle and, and iterate across them around and around. Right now I see very linear progression. What okay. I'd like them to, to do is consider these things um, together. Okay. So, so that's what they would do. So let's take the... Um, and I would... This is getting into probably stuff I would have done earlier if we were doing this as a consultative engagement. But I might do, I'm not going to do this with you now, but I might actually do an empathy map for a student, you know, to try and figure out, you know, what's going on with them. You know, what is it that they're, I probably can guess, but uh, so this is, this would be probably a part of a process to do an empathy map. But I'm going to skip it on the basis of I probably understand what you, kind of who you're talking about. What? It, let me ask you this now. Um, so let's say this. Let's take this model. Did I just kick this out of gear? Pardon me. I, I bumped the camera. Did it? Did I miss? No, it's off? perfect. I can still okay. see every you. So um, I would want to come up with the questions that you could ask a student. Let's say they saw this and they fully understood your your concept model, right? In theory. Yes. Walk them through it and they understood it. What questions should they be able to answer after walking through it? That's a good one. Um, they should be able to understand how a change of framework will affect the feel or how feel okay. might change the interactions. So the how interdependency the, of the elements. How does the feel about a project, about a particular project? Yeah, about a particular project. How does the feel change the information organization or interactions? Okay. So they would be able to, in the context of a project, they would be able to tell you how these things connected or didn't, they would be able to tell you, well, maybe even a simpler way would be able, they would be able to explain the feeling, the interaction, the medium, 
they would be able to explain these components. And, and how they interrelate and how their choices affect each other. Maybe more importantly almost is they might be able to explain why things break. So why is iTunes dreadful? Can we use this framework to figure that one out? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm just wanting to figure out wh how we would test this model, basically, right? Well, that's one of the things. If they understand the model, they should be able to say iTunes is problematic because it doesn't consider or information organization or the feel is out of uh, concord with the interaction model. You know, they may be able to start talking about why things break. I think well, actually, uh, I mean, so there's a couple, there's two, two things that I want to tease out about what you're saying. Um, that what you just said would be true if your model is correct. <laughs> now we can't assume though that your model is correct. We shouldn't assume that. In order to test the model, we just have to be able to have them explain things in terms of the model. So um, what I'm saying is, you know, it may be that iTunes is broken and that your model can explain it. It may be that your model might be insufficient in some way to explain why iTunes is broken. What they should be able to do, though, is look at iTunes, tease out the components, and explain how they relate. And if there's a problem or not, uh, explain why this is good or why it's bad in the context of the model. Do you, does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah, that's well put. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, I, but I think it, it's, it looks like it makes perfect sense to me. But I think what we want to test is not the model. We don't want to test iTunes, in other words. We want to test your model. And we, do, we, we actually aren't even testing your model. We want to test how well people understand it. <laughs> yes. So that's what this test is for. So what we say is, and here's a way to test these models, mine and other ones that you come up with. Put it in front of a student, explain it, and then ask them to explain the components in the context of iTunes or something else. And say, okay, now let's uh, now let's talk about iTunes. Can you explain what the interaction, what the information organization is? Can you explain to me what the organizing principle is? You know, whatever. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes very good sense. Uh, that's so one thing. That I worried about is um, am I conflating when I want it as a model for teaching and a model as crit of as criticism because I think that it theoretically can do both but yeah I think it could I mean sure it should do both uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just wanting to make the distinction between testing people's understanding of the model and testing the model itself got it that's all there would have to be a diff this is a test for how well people understand your model it's not actually testing the validity of the model itself We'd have to come up with some other way to do that. I wish I could um, think of one. <laughs> well, you, I think it would have to be um, you would uh, you might have other mo you might say take Jesse's model and yours, and you would compare how well people could actually solve a interaction problem with one versus the other. You could have a control group. You could have a group that's using your model and a group that's using no model. <laughs> But this is like more in the realm of academia. I don't usually go there. <laughs> I'd prefer not to. Yeah, but I like to test the understanding. That's 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 what I'm into. So, um, yeah, I would take probably take this and and clean it up and actually try and figure out a way to make all these things work. Um, I like the, I, I, I for me the idea of the medium as almost like a like a mirror or a surface of a water or something that you know, someone's reaching into somehow. Uh, I think that's, there's a very, to me, that's a, a nice visual way to describe. You're, you're reaching into the system and you're manipulating these, let's say this is the digital world and this is the physical world. And you have, this is your, you know, you're, you're trying to create, this is what you're trying to create, right? You're trying to create a way for you to reach in and a way for the digital world to come back and touch you somehow. I think I saw this movie. It's a horror <laughs> film. Right? Well, make, maybe let's make it sort of like, um, <laughs> uh, what is it, God and Adam? <laughs> this would be God. God is the digital one, right? <laughs> anyway, whatever you I mean, you, you have this uh, idea of this interaction, or maybe you could do it with arrows. 
um, somehow uh, I have a friend who likes to draw this is this is kind of cool thing that he does Ooh, two arrows pointing at each other oh that's a nice way to do it yeah it's tricky mm. um, but anyway you have so, somehow you have this interaction the action and the response and um, as I think about this I think you're saying you know the organizing framework and the organization is kind of how the computer thinks about it uh, how this or the, how the app thinks about it whatever and there's also this thing about how the human thinks about it how the human feels about it that does worry me what I think we see a lot of mistakes when we think of the way the computer organizes information as opposed to thinking about organizing information the way humans think about it. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I do, and I think actually what your part of your message is that these things should be parallel. They should parallel each other. Yes, they that reflect the, the easier mirror. The more the closer the way the computer thinks about it to the way the human thinks and feels about it, the better, right? Definitely. So there's something about, you know, here's the medium. The medium is the way that the 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 sort of the the thing that mediates all these interactions. So it's like this 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 wavy watery thing. Then you have um Yeah, I think the thing that um the the piece that I think is most uh, kind of still fuzzy to me is the difference between information organizing and organizing framework. Can you talk to me more about those? Because I think this this is a picture that could work, but there's two pieces to this that I don't really understand the difference yet. I think. Well, we can go back. Um... Again, the organizing framework is more like a meta-interaction model. It's, uh, to me, it's more confusing about the interactions. There's macro and micro, right? So the organizing framework is, is this going to be like a, uh, a tool canvas model, a control panel model? Mm -hmm. um, is it going to be, you know, what, what is the thing that holds together all the little micro interactions? Um, I'm going to have to go. I, I got a call coming up in just a few minutes. That's okay. So I think it'd be great. Do you have two minutes left or not? I'm trying to turn off my calendar. Yeah, yes, I do. Okay. So why don't we focus less on this model because I'm just going to fiddle with it forever. Um, the okay. important thing is to talk about, let's say you started to get a model that you liked and you would test it to make sure it was communicating effectively, that it was doing the job it did. Um, how would you say that you sort of finish it up? I mean, I assume that there's going to be some yeah, kind actually, of... You know what I would do? I would probably... Here's what I would do with this piece. Sorry, I'm just distracted by this problem. I would oh, probably I put them into some kind of a funnel and a hierarchy. So there's the choices about how things are organized, and there's a framework that's underneath it or informing it. It might be like this, or it might be like this. But somehow that there's hierarchy there. Does that make sense? I love the way you manipulate the cards. Sorry, I'm excited by what you're doing as well, but yes. <laughs> yeah, there's something there that I might, you know, uh, I think we could find it, or there's a maybe um, a table, and there's stuff that's on top of the table and stuff that's underneath the table. And really, I mean, the the a big takeaway here, I think, uh, for you and maybe for me as well, is what's going on here is I'm trying to create the equivalent of a memory palace. Yes. I know that term. So what? The more that the less that these things can look like um, clip art out of a Microsoft PowerPoint, which there's so many of them. I mean, they you know that there are these frameworks. Well, there's the there's the goal, and there's the three things we're going to use to reach the goal, and then there's a foundation underneath it. That's useful, but it's so generic that it, it actually is very hard to remember. 
And the thing about making putting something in a memory palace for me is make it as concrete as possible, you know, a table or a filing cabinet, actual objects that you can remember and that, can, that are very tangible. So I've got a fluid water. I've got hands going back and forth trying to touch each other. There's a, there's a heart over here, a human being with a heart who's thinking about things. And there's maybe a table or a filing cabinet, whatever. So those things, once they kind of fuse into a, a scene on a stage in your brain, you can call them up. Does that make sense? Oh my god, I mean I would say that 99% of what I do with my students is figure out how I get the ideas into their bodies where they can hold them exactly. and use them when they need them. So I'm exactly. with you. And that would be my, that, that's my critique of a lot of business models is that um, they're very much in this kind of top level domain. They're very abstract and because they're abstract they can feel very useful. They can feel very explanatory while being at the same time extremely vague. Uh, to where you know everyone says they understand them, but everyone understands differently because they, so they think they all agree, but they don't. Which is, I think, one of the reasons that these abstract uh, kind of diagrams are used so often in business because everyone can look at them and go, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm on board, I'm on board with that. And then when you trans, when you take that Venn diagram and you translate it into something that's real for people in the world, they go, that is no way what I want. I did not agree to that. <laughs> that is not what I wanted. It's because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of wiggle room between the abstract diagram and what you actually bring into the world. And I think, Bill, uh, I do think it was Bill Verplank. I may be wrong, but uh, I would highly recommend a look at, he's, there's a couple of YouTube videos where you can actually watch him draw live a model that, about uh, how people interact with machines. That's I will do cool. that. Yeah. I will do that, definitely. So you, you had a question, I'm sorry. Oh, just um, what are your next steps once you have like a sketched out model that you you like you trust? I would get a piece of tape and I, I would redraw this one with the tape. I would find a way to to tease out the difference between the organizing framework and the information organization. Sketch it, then I would take it out or have you take it out and actually test it with people. Talk to people using the model, and then ask them the questions. Ask them, okay, now. I'm going to give you this picture, draw, draw the picture for him or give him the picture saying, I'm going to give you the picture or we're going to put it up on the wall and I want you to talk me through iTunes and all where all these elements are in iTunes. Or you could make this, you could take this same model and make it like a worksheet, you know, so where you actually had spaces like, you know, here's the heart space, here's the thinking space, here's the uh, whatever, and then you could say, fill this out for iTunes, right? And each one of these things actually had like space where you could write in it, you know. And you say, no, I want you to fill this out for iTunes. I want you to fill this out for uh, Amazon Marketplace. I want you to fill this out for whatever, you know, uh, the the uh, smart uh, self-adjusting chair, whatever. I love this. I love the worksheet idea. That's great. Yes, I, I think that's the next thing. I, I would make it a worksheet. I would have a diagram or that you were comfortable drawing. Uh, or a worksheet that you could actually draw and fill out, then I would give it to, the way to test it would be, I would give it to a student and say, okay, fill this out for uh, for Clash of Clans. What's the mood? What's the thought? What's the organizing principle? What's the action? What's the response? What's the medium? Um, something like that. I think you found a really critical missing step, which I think is invaluable. For mm -hmm. is I love the testing piece. Test I, it. The, oh yeah, man. Duh, right. That's the uh, that's what it, that's what powered a lot of explains success in doing the visual thinking work that we did. It was we always insisted on having a testable model, something that we could actually where we could test the understanding. And that um, the best way to test understanding is have you know it's like it's what they say in agile. You write the test before you do the thing. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. You're absolutely right. That's perfect. Write the test before you do the thing. Ah. And who do I think is a great early version of the test? Yeah, that's that's how we would do the test. We would do we would start with the who do, um, then we would go to um, uh, an empathy map of the critical people if we didn't understand them. Then we would start to nail down questions. So what are the questions that? this person would need to be able to answer in order to be able to do the thing. So they kind of triangulate with each other a bit. Got it. 
So do you have uh, one more minute for one more question? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering about the use of color. Um, do you try to make your models basically not need color or? Yeah, I try to make them work without color. Yeah. Uh, if, they, if, they, if they work without color, then, I mean, uh, that's very good. That's a very good sign. <laughs> if you need color, it's probably a symptom that, you know, unless the model is specifically about color or referencing color. Um, yeah, the new Interactions of Color app is mind-blowing. It's really good. But sometimes, you, color. You, sometimes color can be helpful. Like if you're trying to do things like red, green, and yellow for green is go and yellow is caution and red is stop, there, there are times when color can be useful. But in even when color is useful, they should be objects that are familiar and recognizable. So if I had a traffic light as part, let's say there was some kind of a switching mechanism where a traffic light could be useful, right? I would I would actually think about the traffic light as the object and then use red, yellow, and green. So the, the idea is to um, have these kind of hooks that already exist in people's brains that you can you can hook into the a concept that people already have, like a traffic signal or a stop sign. You can hook that to your concept that you're trying to explain and, and build a model where they're all kind of uh, they're interacting in a way, like a model train set, the things are all interacting in a way that makes perfect sense. Now I really do have to go because I'm going to get a call at 11.25. <laughs> Thank you for letting me ask that last question. Okay. Thanks, Dave, for awesome. your time. This was massive. Yeah, send me the link so I can watch the video. Oh, I sure will. Bye. Okay. Bye.